Hello, welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review. I'm Dr. Lewis Hostel coming to you from the campus of the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And I'm pleased to have you join me for this uh, session as I'll try to explain my approach to ovarian frozen sections. There's probably no other single procedure in gynecologic surgical pathology that is as challenging as uh, dealing with the demands of an intraoperative uh, consultation about an ovarian tumor uh, or enlarged uh, ovarian mass. Uh, but there are certain things that we can do as we approach this uh, challenge to uh, make it uh, more manageable and to provide better services to our colleagues, uh, the gynecologic oncologists or surgeons who may present us with these lesions. Uh, my approach involves uh, looking at a number of parameters. But first, I think it's important to remember that our goal with ovarian frozen section is not to provide a definitive diagnosis, but primarily to differentiate benign from malignant, and I would add borderline disease, or to differentiate primary from likely metastatic disease. These two questions are critically important. Uh, to further procedures in the operating room. Of course, we wanna make sure that we have adequate tissue to provide a diagnosis. Uh, if, for example, if they're just doing a laparoscopic procedure and uh, by the, on the basis of the kind of uh, histologic uh, findings we find that may determine what types of intraoperative staging or debulking uh, goes forward. Additionally, with some tumors, it's very helpful to alert them to the need to get a proper serologic markers while they may still have a relatively pristine uh, preoperative pre-surgical blood sample available for such testing. Uh, there's nothing worse than trying to differentiate a germ cell tumor and not having the advantage of preoperative serum uh, markers to help guide you to make sure that you've detected all the various components that can be present in those lesions. Now, there are benefits that accrue to the pathologist as well uh, by doing ovarian frozen sections. First of all, uh, that uh, fresh examination can help to guide your sectioning. Uh, if you know that it's a mucinous tumor, you're going to section it much more liberally than if it's a solid uh, fibrothecoma, for example. Uh, you're also, be able, also able to alert them, uh, be alert to the differential diagnosis and anticipate the kind of uh, special stains or immunohistochemical workup, or perhaps even uh, uh, fish testing or molecular workup that may be required. And also, this is a, the ideal time to uh, gain firsthand information from the surgeon, uh, such as history and clinical backdrop, to help you with staging information. Now, there are a couple of other things that uh, we need to be aware of, and, and, and that is which specific diagnoses or what kind of wording is going to lead to further uh, uh, changes in the operative plan. So I like to think of these as the kind of trigger diagnoses that may lead to additional sampling. Anytime I diagnose this, a serous, mucinous, uh, or endometrioid tumor uh, that is uh, borderline or worse, uh, they're going to go after multiple peritoneal staging biopsies in our institutions. Likewise, sex cord stromal tumors, Sertoli lytic tumors, and so forth, these are going to trigger a uh, good thorough search of the abdominal cavity for possible implants or spread. Germ cell tumors, likewise, immature teratoma, a variety of germ cell tumor uh, also can trigger that kind of uh, search. And lastly, I think it's helpful to uh, be sure to state uh, and recognize that how age can impact your differential diagnosis. I've had egg on my face uh, looking at a high-grade tumor, assuming it was an older patient and reporting it as a high-grade malignant uh, tumor, probably carcinoma, only to discover that the patient was 20 years old, had an elevated AFP, and I was barking up the wrong tree. So uh, look at the age, gauge your differential based on that kind of clinical as well as the pathologic findings that you're dealing with. So with that, let's take a look at some of the gross patterns that we can encounter in ovarian tumors. 
And I think primarily of these five patterns, solid, mixed solid and cystic, fleshy, uh, gelatinous, and heterogeneous, kind of a mixed bag of everything. So uh, in the solid lesions, uh, there is a certain category of uh, lesion that you're going to encounter more frequently here. Fibrothecomas, fibrosarcomas, thecomas, granulosa cell tumor, some other sex cord stromal tumors, metastatic carcinomas like Krukenberg's, smooth muscle tumors, and occasionally massive edema, although that is more commonly a gelatinous pattern. The um, <clears throat> examples I've chosen for you here, uh, here's an example of a granulosa cell tumor, and you can see that it's mostly solid. Uh, as we come into uh, higher magnification, you can see that it has this microscopic pattern of uh, follicular structures uh, admixed with this uh, somewhat organoid uh, uh, geographic uh, nests of cells that we see here. And I will say here in anticipation of the other clinical digital slides that I'm going to show you that I have tried to choose frozen section slides themselves so that you can have an appreciation for how these uh, lesions may differ somewhat or how the architecture may be altered by the uh, frozen uh, artifact that we encounter with these samples. And here you note that there's this uh, peripheral uh, row of cells around many of these nests that almost looks like a carcinoid tumor, uh, but with this macro follicular pattern and uh, uh, the other findings, this was ultimately a granulosa cell tumor of the adult type. Uh, another example um, here, a uh, different type of stromal tumor, uh, microcystic stromal tumor. Uh, you can see it has a very cellular areas and very uh, dense uh, whitish uh, collagenous bands here um, and uh, the very solid pattern uh, that looks a little bit epithelioid because of the nests and microcystic uh, changes but it has a lot of uh, solid stromal elements to it as well. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each individual frozen section slide uh, so that you can uh, be motivated to perhaps come back and study them on your own. Now, the second pattern that I've mentioned is the papillary cystic uh, lesions. Uh, and here's a nice example of this, a uh, fallopian tube here with sort of uh, encrusted end and surface papillary structures here along the surface of this ovarian mass, which as you might imagine was uh, largely cystic and had similar structures on the interior uh, wall of the cyst. These lesions, uh, the borderline tumors, the, uh, the uh, other lesions that we've uh, dictated here uh, tend to have this very nice uh, papillary pattern. And here's a very classic appearance of a serous borderline tumor uh, with these second and third order branching, as well as the very edematous uh, papillae, some of which have no branching. Uh, but uh, when you see areas such as these with uh, a uh, little bit of uh, micropapillary changes and uh, a lot of uh, filigree to the sample, uh, you should be uh, moving that towards the uh, borderline cap category. Now, another example, uh, the mixed solid and cystic. Here you see the mixture of sort of solid, uh, slightly gelatinous areas and some cystic areas, a variegated appearance. Uh, these are tumors where you're going to need to sample fairly thoroughly. Sometimes your common epithelial tumors, uh, endometrioid or serous tumors, can look a little bit like this. Some sex cord stromal tumors can also have this appearance. Teratoma and mixed germ cell tumors, this was a teratoma uh, with an associated carcinoma, uh, can also have this appearance. And occasionally metastatic tumors can mimic uh, this pattern uh, nicely as well. So here's a nice uh, microscopic slide showing you an area of solid uh, pattern um, and some areas of uh, mucinous differentiation here uh, in this as well. Uh, clearly, this is uh, a little bit more complicated. We see sort of a, an enteric goblet cell type pattern in some of these areas and quite complex architecture, although the cytology is uh, relatively benign. So some areas like this might be borderline 
or this might in fact be pushing invasion uh, and sampling would uh, need to be required to uh, uh, indicate or differentiate that uh, completely. So I would use the term, you know, mucinous tumor, at least borderline. Here's another example, a uh, mature cystic keratoma in this component. Um, as you can see, the epithelial structures, the keratin. Now, usually this type of lesion is evident on gross examination, uh, but in this case, the uh, tumor was uh, quite large uh, and had some variegated appearances. So we froze this section for the more routine areas and chose other areas to sample as well uh, to rule out uh, mixed components of higher grade or more serious uh, different uh, uh, morphology. Another example of mixed uh, uh, serous pattern, um, serous borderline tumor uh, in this situation. So you can see there can be some overlap between the uh, mixed uh, solid and cystic and between the papillary cystic um, and in terms of the category that uh, an individual tumor may fall into on its gross evaluation. Uh, we'll talk about the microscopic patterns uh, as well here in just a minute. Uh, another example, uh, this a clear cell carcinoma. As you can see, some solid areas, fairly uh, dense uh, tumor areas um, here with uh, a lot of uh, kind of uh, pink solid tissue, not a lot of papillarity to it, but some cystic spaces. Uh, now, oftentimes uh, with uh, clear cell carcinoma, you can uh, see the features on frozen section that you see here, this nice clearing of the cytoplasm. You may see hobnailing in some areas uh, of the, with the apical nuclei. Don't see that particularly well here, uh, but you'll perhaps notice the eosinophilic droplets or the hyalinization of the uh, stroma that can be also be clues for clear cell carcinoma. Um, but even if you don't make that specific diagnosis, uh, the fact that you're able to make this as a high-grade epithelial tumor uh, carcinoma uh, is sufficient to allow the uh, gynecologic oncologist to uh, proceed with the appropriate procedure, uh, staging, and so forth to uh, optimally care for their patient. Now, the gelatinous pattern um, can uh, be seen in uh, perhaps most commonly in struma ovarii, and some sex cord stromal tumors as well can have a very mucoid solid appearance. Uh, massive edema of the ovary, which this is a gross picture from, uh, can have this sort of uh, glistening gelatinous appearance. Um, and some metastatic uh, tumors, especially mucinous tumors, uh, as well as pseudomyxoma ovarii, uh, essentially a, a extracellular mucin uh, to the extreme in the, in the ovary. And then some other carcinomas can have this pattern as well. So here's an, uh, the histologic section from the massive ovarian edema case. And you can see here that we have just a lot of very edematous stroma, a little maybe thin rim on the surface of slightly preserved architecture, um, and a lot of open space filled with fluid that is accounting for that uh, very gelatinous appearance, uh, sort of a mixoid uh, pattern here. Uh, but uh, the key here would be to uh, not make a diagnosis of malignancy, but to identify this as a potentially stromal tumor or massive edema. Uh, if you make that diagnosis on frozen section, you obviously save the patient from uh, further staging biopsies, which would not be uh, required in this circumstance. And age helps you here a little bit because these are usually younger patients. They're not the perimenopausal patients uh, who tend to have um, epithelial tumors. Another slide from that same case, again, nicely illustrating the uh, cortical sparing and the fairly solid, but some areas sort of uh, falling apart to gelatinous areas here um, with a lot of uh, intercellular edema and uh, very little in the way of uh, epithelial differentiation. But you can see here how some of the frozen section artifact 
uh, could be distorting or create ice crystals or create some sense that there's maybe a, a streaming pattern or something of that sort going on here. So uh, mistaking this for a stromal neoplasm is certainly understandable. Uh, however, if you're able to identify normal ovarian structures within this, either uh, follicles or uh, corporate albicantia or something of that sort, uh, that may help to solidify your diagnosis. And another sort of complex category of mucinous uh, carcinoma. Um, this is uh, not your typical uh, mucinous tumor, but is in fact an endometrioid uh, tumor with some mucinous differentiation, which you can see here as you identify that these cells are not uh, producing a lot of individual mucin, but they have this sort of smooth surfaced uh, component with uh, just areas of uh, mucinous differentiation, as you see here. But again, the diagnosis doesn't need to be specific. You only need to uh, classify this as uh, an adenocarcinoma by informing them that it's a um, mucin-producing tumor or a uh, tumor with uh, mucinous features, and you're thinking about endometrioid versus other, uh, that can help to guide them in terms of what kind of staging or further surgery they do. Uh, primarily to know, do they need to run the GI tract? Do they need to uh, remove the appendix uh, to uh, deal with the potential problem of metastasis? So the uh, next pattern is the fleshy pattern. As you can see, it's a very kind of uh, carcinomatous type of pattern, very frequently associated with uh, densely epithelial tumors. Uh, but this can be seen with small cell tumors, carcinomas, both primary and metastatic, uh, colon, colon cancers can have this pattern. Uh, some sex cord stromal tumors that are highly epithelioid, and certainly germ cell tumors can present with this uh, fleshy pattern as well as immature teratomas. Occasionally lymphomas in the ovary will present uh, with this sort of uh, fish flesh type of appearance, uh, much more homogeneous than you see here, uh, which is more of a multinodular, almost mixed pattern with solid and focally cystic areas. Seen that? So our example of this is a nice example of serous carcinoma, uh, where you see here a very a dense uh, area of tumor, a lot of epithelioid cells, high-grade nuclei, very pleomorphic, multinucleate, a um, lot of mitotic activity, um, little intervening stroma that we would associate with uh, serous carcinoma uh, in this solid, few slit-like spaces and sort of micropapillary uh, pattern. <clears throat> this is the high-grade uh, serous type carcinoma. Um, and while not uh, entirely specific, um, I've often been able to feel confident enough to say in the right clinical and pathologic setting, this would be compatible with a high-grade serous carcinoma and so forth to allow them to uh, then say, okay, we've got enough, we can close, give new adjuvant treatment and come back for definitive debulking uh, later on. And that's very frequently the course of things in our institution uh, peritoneal biopsy or ovarian biopsy that shows uh, serous carcinoma, several uh, rounds of chemotherapy with cisplatin-based uh, agents, and then uh, uh, definitive surgery. Uh, here's another example, uh, this uh, germ cell tumor, and you can see, again, this is a very solid uh, tumor, um, a lot of uh, nested areas, very blue, um, and uh, a little bit of discohesion to these cells. Um, so, uh, while you might uh, think about uh, uh, other carcinomas, uh, the uh, age group and uh, the morphology with uh, fairly monotonous cells, moderate amount of cytoplasm, some uh, necrosis, and perhaps maybe you'll be able to identify a few lymphocytes here and there might say, oh, this would be consistent with the germ cell tumor. Uh, and then if the surgeon told you, well, there's an elevated HCG, you would, of course, know that you're going to have to look for other elements uh, to define that uh, more fully. Another example, same diagnosis. Um, I'm not sure this is a frozen slide, but I think you can get the sense again that it's a very solid tumor, intervening bands of fibrous tissue. 
And notice that, uh, you know, unlike the testis, we don't always get a whole lot of uh, uh, lymphocytes that mixed with this tumor. Um, so, you know, don't make your diagnosis based on the presence or absence of lymphocytes. Uh, recognize the uh, morphology of a epithelioid appearing tumor, uh, highly mitotically active, moderate amounts of cytoplasm uh, in the appropriate age group, uh, and uh, you'll be uh, usually right in that uh, circumstance, especially if you've got any sort of serologic uh, clues to provide uh, help and support for your diagnosis. And finally, the last category, what I've been terming the heterogeneous category, it just can't make up its mind between being solid, cystic, papillary, fleshy, or otherwise. And so um, these tumors can really fall into any of the categories, teratomas, carcinomas, sex cord stromal tumors, metastatic tumors. Um, these are all possibilities uh, in this, uh, in this uh, realm. And I'll just show you uh, one example here. This is a dysterminoma, um, frozen artifact up the, uh, to the extreme here. Um, and I, I do this to show you that, uh, you know, we're not uh, perfect in our uh, frozen section technology. We do practice at it a lot, uh, but uh, you're not going to have all the great uh, advantages of uh, great histology when you're dealing with one of these cases. So how did we get to the diagnosis of uh, dysgerminoma? Well, it's the pattern of sort of nested cells, poorly cohesive, necrosis, fairly uniform cell size. And we had a little bit of serologic help as well, as well as the age. Uh, another example, again, uh, artifacts from our scanner, apologize for that. Um, and you can see the sectioning artifacts here. Uh, sort of a solid hemorrhagic uh, lesion. There were some cystic, uh, totally necrotic areas. We selected away from those. Um, and you can see here uh, this pattern. Now here we do get a little bit of a clue that there may be some lymphocytes associated with this. Uh, so that may help the diagnosis. But as you can see, there's been a little bit of drying artifact with this slide. Uh, the nuclear details are not totally crisp. There's a little bit of extra eosin between the cells here. Um, and so you, you're dealing with, uh, um, how would I say this? You're, you're, you're fighting this battle without a very sharp sword. Um, and it's a, a little bit challenging. Uh, so you got to use all the clues that you've got, both gross, microscopic, as well as age group and clinical, if you can uh, add those in. Here's another example, this from a uh, mucinous tumor. Uh, this one, uh, quite uh, uh, a lot of dense, very uh, solid, almost mixoid or mucinous uh, tissue. Um, and here you see this uh, epithelium is quite, uh, quite atypical. There's still sort of basal nuclei, uh, but you're dealing here with at least probably intraepithelial carcinoma. Uh, in this uh, mucinous tumor. You can see the columnar cells and some mucin production. Um, and so when I see that, I, I tell them, you know, this is a, a mucinous tumor, uh, but we have at least intraepithelial carcinoma, and we'll be looking very clear, closely to find areas of invasion and so forth. And that helps to uh, trigger them uh, to doing the proper staging. Now, sometimes on frozen section, the uh, nature of the, muc of the mucin can be a clue to this uh, dirty, uh, to the uh, sort of high grade appearance. And here you see that this uh, mucin is both bloody and has uh, exfoliated cells and nuclear debris in it. And that's sort of the uh, tumor diathesis, if you will, for this tumor that is uh, sort of being escaped or escaping into the lumen. And that's a clue to look for the high-grade histology that you can see here uh, on this uh, section. Well, let's talk about the various microscopic patterns that you might encounter uh, with uh, uh, ovarian frozen sections, because that also is one of the clues. So we mentioned the epithelial line cystic uh, pattern that is most common with the mucinous and serous uh, tumors, both borderline, uh, benign, and malignant. 
Um, and there's this more solid epithelioid and monomorphous uh, pattern that we've seen in uh, granulosa cell tumors and so forth. There's a tubular or tubulocystic or trabecular patterns sort of have this sort of somewhat unique uh, flavor to them. Uh, follicular pattern can be seen, mesenchymal patterns. And then there's the kind of the di or multimorphic uh, uh, patterns where you have a stromal and a, an epithelial or a tubular pattern as well. And finally, I'll just mention small cell patterns that do occur. Uh, we've uh, alluded to lymphoma as being one of the main ones in that category, but there are also small cell carcinomas here. So let's take a look through some of these and uh, think about these. So um, epithelial line cystic tumors, there are of course the papillary tumors, the serous borderline or serous carcinomas, seromucinous tumors, mucinous tumors. Clear cell carcinoma can occasionally have this uh, epithelial line cystic patterns and some endometrioid tumors as well. Um, if the uh, surfaces are uh, very smooth, um, you'd want to think about uh, mucinous tumors or benign serous tumors. On the other hand, if they're very uh, irregular and ragged, you're going to be thinking more of the borderline uh, tumors. Uh, some of the yolk sac patterns, polyvitaline duct, can have this pattern as well. And occasionally, granulosa cell can have sort of macro follicles that can look sort of epithelial lined cystic uh, like, uh, although the uh, lining will be uh, either attenuated to variably uh, several la cell layers thick. So here's one example. Um, again, a mucinous uh, carcinoma, uh, which you can see has uh, mucin production, cystic spaces, a little bit of papillarity here. Uh, you, we can look around the bubbles here on our slide. Um, and we may not see anything on this uh, particular section that uh, looks uh, to be uh, clearly invasive carcinoma. Uh, but if we do, we can certainly report that. Um, you can get an idea of kind of what we're looking at here. Uh, this is uh, obviously a very stratified uh, epithelium. Um, and so this is an adenocarcinoma with mucinous features, uh, perhaps even maybe the similar one to the one we looked at earlier. Now, of course, I'll provide for you the uh, link to the digital slides so that you can come back and take a look at these at your leisure. I think as a collection of frozen section slides, it's fairly useful uh, to study these uh, in the context of uh, the various uh, patterns that we've uh, discussed. Uh, here's a nice example of the uh, very papillary tumor. Um, and with this, it's very busy. The uh, papillary, papillary cores are relatively small. And you see that we have a lot of, uh, a lot of these that are totally surrounded by papillary proliferation. So we might even be thinking about the so-called uh, uh, micropapillary uh, uh, subtype of the serous borderline tumor, uh, which is uh, more frequently associated with uh, uh, extra ovarian spread and a more carcinomatous type of behavior. Uh, again, I wouldn't uh, feel the need to make that distinction on frozen section. Uh, by simply classifying it as, a, as at least a borderline tumor, uh, that allows the surgeon to make all the uh, uh, therapeutic and surgical decisions he needs to make uh, uh, during the operation. Here's another example of this pattern, very papillary. Uh, this uh, not from an ovarian tumor, but a nearby ovarian tumor thought possibly to be uh, ovarian. Uh, this is a nice example of the uh, uh, multilocular um, mesothelial cyst. Uh, and as you can see here, we have the cystic spaces, but we have very, very smooth, low cuboidal or even uh, attenuated uh, epithelial or mesothelial type lining uh, that is characteristic of this uh, multilocular peritoneal uh, cystic lesion. Um, and uh, by making that distinction or by making this uh, you know, benign uh, multilocular cystic uh, structure uh, description allows the surgeon to avoid uh, doing uh, staging or even removing the ovary uh, in the thoughts that they may have uh, an ovarian cancer or borderline tumor. Uh, 
this is uh, this is not one I want to discuss here. We'll come back to this uh, lesion at a later stage. Well, actually, goes with this stage. So, solid epithelial monomorphous uh, tumors. There are a number of things that can fit into this category. Uh, the Krukenberg tumor, uh, some high grade serous and endometrial high grade tumors, uh, even de differentiated tumors, Brenner tumors, um, undifferentiated tumors, dystrophin elbows, and so forth. So, this is a broad area, uh, this category. And it includes this lesion, the uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma. Uh, that you see here, a very solid proliferation with these nested areas that look a little bit epithelioid, uh, certainly look different uh, from these other uh, tissues around it. Uh, and you can see it's here infiltrating through the uh, uh, myomatous tissue of the adnexi. Uh, and uh, that uh, helps you to uh, identify it. However, when you come to higher magnification, and this is not a frozen section, this is just a a nice uh, histologic section. You can see that it has a more uh, mesenchymal component to it, more mesenchymal appearance rather than the epithelioid appearance. Oops. Hit the wrong button there. We go here. So here's another uh, tumor um, with a nice solid. Uh, appearance, somewhat uh, graded uh, areas. Um, this could have come from other sites, but uh, taken from an adnexal site. Uh, you can see that it has a, a, a you know, fairly diffuse type of architecture, um, it has a little bit of the very delicate vasculature uh, that you might associate with uh, <clears throat> some stromal tumors or endometrial stromal tumor. Um, this could be an ovarian stromal tumor or um, an endometrial stromal tumor based on the morphology. And so in the rendering a diagnosis, you want to say, well, this is a low-grade uh, um, mesenchymal uh, neoplasm. Uh, you know, could be an, a, a sex cord stromal tumor. It could be a low-grade uh, stromal sarcoma. Um, and then based on kind of that uh, understanding, they could make the appropriate decisions or there may actually have been a history of an endometrial tumor, in which case they would know this was a recurrence um, in the adnexi. Um, here's massive ovarian edema, another entity that can appear in this uh, uh, solid uh, 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 and sometimes epithelioid category. We've looked at the somewhat epithelioid-like areas that can occur in here. Uh, where some of this more solid tumor can look a little, or more solid uh, tissue can look a little bit streamy, uh, a little bit of sort of epithelioid cytoplasm. Uh, so you, you don't want to mistake that for uh, epithelial uh, neoplasm. And here, uh, uh, immature teratoma pattern. Uh, this actually is uh, not immature teratoma, but this is. Uh, as you can see here, a uh, mixed epithelioid cystic uh, pattern. This looks much more like a yolk sac tumor. Um, and uh, in fact, that is this, what this component is. You can see the chains and cords of cells. Uh, you might not see a classic Schiller-Duval body uh, in this lesion. But in addition to that, uh, down here at this other end here, uh, we see that we had um, some different components. And uh, you can see it's very blue, very fleshy. Um, and if you look closely, you can identify there are a few little rosette-like structures uh, in this mix. Here's one, here's another one. Uh, and so we were able to make the diagnosis of uh, mixed uh, immature teratoma with yolk sac tumor from this single nice uh, frozen section slide uh, taken from the appropriate area. You can see some more glial areas around here and more of the uh, yolk sac component here, uh, right up and against the uh, uh, immature teratoma. Another example in this category here, uh, metastatic tumor. Um, and you can see here we have some preserved architecture and a nested, rounded pattern. Um, 
and this is actually uh, uh, a very nice uh, epithelial appearing carcinoma. It has uh, a stratified appearance to it, uh, a little bit of clearing, some basal or sort of palisading appearance, sort of a smooth surface here. This looks very urothelial. Um, and so you might uh, wonder, is this a you know, malignant Brenner tumor um, or some other urothelial neoplasm? In fact, this was a patient who had a history of urothelial carcinoma, and this was metastatic urothelial carcinoma uh, in this nice solid uh, pattern. Tubulocystic and trabecular patterns, these can be seen in uh, particularly carcinoid tumors, but Sertoli lighting tumors, we have the classic uh, trabecular and tubulocystic pattern. Uh, granulosa cell tumor uh, can have this pattern. Yolk sac tumor, as you see, it's a nice picture here. And some endometrioid tumors uh, can have this. Now, what I left off of here, of course, is also clear cell carcinoma, <clears throat> uh, which can have this uh, tubulocystic uh, pattern as well, especially the polyvitaline duct uh, variant. Uh, here's a nice uh, example, uh, clear cell carcinoma. Well, this doesn't have quite the tubulocystic pattern, but it does have a little bit of the trabecular uh, pattern. And you can see a few cystic structures here um, and uh, some sense that there's a little bit of a trabecular formation. Um, and it's not the classic uh, uh, clear cell changes. So there can be eosinophilic variants of clear cell carcinoma. Uh, and this is one of those uh, more eosinophilic variant type lesions where you would need to use other uh, features to identify this as uh, the uh, correct uh, diagnosis. Follicular patterns, we've mentioned already the granulosa cell pattern. You've seen this, uh, this picture. Struma ovary, of course, can have that with nice thyroid type lesions. Uh, Sertoli lighting cell tumors and uh, Carcinoid, along with struma, uh, uh, can have that appearance as well. So uh, I don't have a nice carcinoid appearance, but here's a nice uh, granulosa cell pattern, uh, the juvenile variety. Uh, and you can see these very nice, large follicular structures uh, surrounded by, uh, uh, here's actually a big macro follicle here, uh, and some smaller follicular structures here. Um, so recognizing this as a, uh, uh, stromal tumor is very helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can uh, suggest based on age or based on the morphology uh, that it's going to be more likely to be a juvenile granulosa cell tumor because it's maybe more mitotically active or something of that sort, that can be helpful. Uh, although, uh, fundamentally, the treatment uh, intraoperatively for both a juvenile and adult granulosa cell tumor is identical, and you don't need to worry about uh, uh, messing up uh, their plans uh, with that uh, pattern. But I think uh, the follicular uh, pattern, uh, large thin fluid filled follicles, uh, round to oval uh, nuclei with fairly abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, uh, fairly frequent mitotic figures, if you're uh, fortunate to be able to identify those on frozen section, can all steer you into the correct uh, diagnosis with that lesion. Uh, here's another example. And uh, you can see here that we've got an epithelioid appearing neoplasm. Um, we've got some sort of cystic spaces. This is actually a mixed uh, dysgerminoma and yolk sac tumor. We knew this was a younger patient. Um, and uh, the yolk sac component had this uh, sort of uh, macro follicular pattern, uh, the dysgerminoma here, which you see here uh, over in this area. Um, and the dysgerminoma had some of that because of the sort of uh, cystic change uh, to it. Uh, this was uh, one section. There were other sections that had more classic yolk sac tumor in it. And that brings up an important point that as you're doing frozen sections in the ovary, um, I almost routinely uh, 
would strongly recommend that you do two or more blocks of uh, tissue uh, to uh, make sure that you have as little reason for sampling error on your frozen section as possible. Now, the mesenchymal lesions, the fibroma thecoma, granulosa cell tumors, but especially the more poorly differentiated ones and the poorly differentiated sarcotolelytic tumors, uh, stromal tumors and sarcomas, fibrosarcomas, smooth muscle tumors. Uh, there is this entity called a pseudopapillary, solid pseudopapillary tumor that has been described in the ovary, which would often have a mesenchymal pattern and occasionally other sex cord stromal tumors like the microcystic stromal tumor or the um, uh, poly or the uh, signal ring cell stromal tumor. So here's our example. We showed you the uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma earlier. Uh, here's the same case uh, in this uh, particular setting occurring in the adnexa for comparison. Now the multimorphic uh, tumors, uh, these are the fun ones, the heterologous elements sorts of things. Sertoli lighting cell tumors probably top the bill here, but carcinosarcoma, adenosarcomas can occur, especially in the setting of endometriosis or uh, other things. Synovial sarcoma has occasionally been uh, rarely des uh, described in the ovary. And then you have the teratomas, which can have uh, multiple uh, germlines uh, expressing there. And yolk sac tumor can also occasionally have sort of a dimorphic appearance, some hepatoid areas, more uh, heterogeneous areas as well. Uh, so I include that in this list of uh, uh, morphologies as well. So uh, here's an example of a Sertoli Leidig cell tumor. Uh, don't have a lot of examples of this on frozen section. And this is uh, not perhaps the best example uh, because uh, it's uh, somewhat heteromorphous, I guess, uh, but it doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, mesenchymal elements to it. But you can see that it's got this, uh, you know, small uh, tubular trabecular pattern here. Um, and as you look around, it also seems to have some of this more loose stromal element to it uh, that's a part of the tumor. You may not be able to identify lighting cell tumors in some of these uh, uh, cases early on, but you can identify that this looks like it fits into the sex cord stromal category and uh, await your permanent sections uh, to make your definitive diagnosis and to hunt and sample it sufficiently so that you don't miss those uh, rare foci of uh, lighting cells, which probably is what we're, we've got right there, uh, a little cluster of them and maybe another little cluster over here. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're not able to feel confident with that, just giving the diagnosis of a sex cord stromal tumor uh, as the likely category uh, is sufficient to allow the uh, uh, surgeon to carry out his uh, duty and get you the rest of the samples that you need. Uh, another tumor that can have this uh, sort of dimorphous and heteromorphous uh, tumor is this one. This was a challenging one for us on frozen section. We looked at it. It has sort of this mixed uh, follicular pattern, but then it also has a sort of a trabecular pattern here with sort of nests and cords of cells. Uh, and there were some areas where these sort of almost appeared to be stromal uh, type tissue, uh, very solid. Uh, I wasn't sure if they were squamoid or what was going on with this. Um, and so uh, this, you know, nice uh, tubular structures and then it's more cellular stromal background. This was a challenging frozen section. Um, and uh, we considered things like endometrioid carcinomas, considered things like uh, sex cord stromal tumors, maybe Sertoli lytic tumors. Uh, the one thing that we didn't mention uh, as we gave our differential was what this turned out to be. And that was a female adnexal tumor of possible, probable Wolfian origin. So yes, after a, a myriad of special stains, um, we were able to correctly classify it into that grouping. Uh, but the important thing is, is that uh, from a management standpoint, uh, as a frozen section, you don't have to make that home run diagnosis uh, on frozen section. Now here you can see some of these more stromal uh, areas around some of the epithelioid areas. This is not normal stroma in the, in the tumor. This is part of the tumor. 
So uh, just to give that little caveat that occasionally rare birds are going to come up and bite you, uh, like the fatwa or something, uh, but they won't bite you if you've been thinking categorically management-wise, what does the surgeon need to do with a tumor that has this kind of morphology? Well, they need to stage that patient and uh, so forth. So uh, that's uh, my little word of wisdom. Finally, the small cell, car small cell type, a variety of things can fit into this morphology, small cell carcinoma of hypercalcemic type, although this is not really all that small a cell, as you can see here in these, these uh, slide here. Small cell carcinoma of pulmonary type, more, more characteristically small cell. Metastatic tumors, sometimes metastatic small cell tumors, metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, lymphoma, uh, extreme uh, amounts of immature teratoma will have this pattern. Occasionally granulosa cell or undifferentiated carcinoma can fit into this uh, category as well um, and uh, mislead you. So here's my one example of a uh, ovarian small cell carcinoma. Um, and as you can see, it's very blue, a lot of necrosis. Um, and uh, looking at this tumor, what do you need to tell them? Well, you need to tell them this is a small cell malignant neoplasm and that you'll go to, go to work on it. Uh, you might ask, does the patient have hypercalcemia at the time you're intraoperatively consulting with them? Because that can help you. Uh, but you don't need to make that diagnosis uh, de novo uh, based on the morphology. Uh, you can suffice to say this is a small cell malignant neoplasm uh, consistent with small cell carcinoma or lymphoma or uh, you know, rhabdomyosarcoma or any of a number of other possibilities uh, based on the clinical scenario. So with that, we come to the last of the categories. I hope this has been helpful for you and that you'll find it useful to use uh, gross and microscopic patterns to think about your differential diagnosis, to remember the differential varies with age, and to realize that to be a, a very uh, capable consultant, you don't have to provide uh, the full and complete final diagnosis on frozen section. You only need to guide the surgeon's hand in terms of staging and management of the patient intraoperatively, uh, and also to guide your workup uh, subsequently so that you can provide the care that you want for that patient. So I thank you for uh, joining me for this session. If it's been useful, please give us some comments and hit a like. Uh, and we hope also that you'll subscribe uh, because uh, that does help our channel and also helps you to receive notice of uh, new releases from our uh, archives uh, as well. So until next time, Thanks for joining me.